So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ahmadu wa usalli ala Rasul Kareem. We're here uh, for round two of our talks with Dr. Omar Zaid in Buffalo. Mm. And uh, so, uh, yesterday uh, we were talking about how broken hearts and injustice and the lack of proper love, the three types that you described, uh, lead to a state where it becomes very easy for people to deny uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that uh, regard, uh, I just wanted to mention, you know, there's a na- famous narration of the Prophet in which a, a person gave a gift to one of his sons. Mm-hmm. And he came to the Prophet and says, Prophet, bear witness, I'm giving my horse to my son. Mm-hmm. And the Prophet said, did you give it to your other children? Mm-hmm. And he said, no. And the Prophet said, I cannot be a witness to that. Mm-hmm. And then another time, uh, a man saw the Prophet kill, kiss his grandchild. And the man's like, I have ten sons and I have never kissed any of them. And the Prophet says, what can you do with the person who has no mercy? <laughs> and so, um, you know, not seeing that justice, and you made a connection between justice and tawheed yesterday. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I titled the talk yesterday, Broken Hearts Need to Atheism. Yeah, I was uh, interested to see, uh, or in still am, why you chose that title. <clears throat> because when there's no justice, as uh, we were discussing yesterday, when mm. kids say, that's not fair, that's not fair. Yes. You know, and that, that trust is broken. Mm-hmm. And because we talked about trust yesterday, and how trust... Oh, so and, you're equating a broken trust with a broken heart. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's fair. That's a, that's a fair uh, assessment, because that's what happens. Um, the, the trust can be broken for different reasons. Uh, sometimes the trust is, uh, is a trust in... Uh, uh, the wrong kind of uh, thinking, mm. even mm. you see. For example, if you if you marry somebody for uh, what you think is the romantic equivalent of you know Valentine's Day love, uh, that's okay. It's, but that's only one level of mm. uh, of, uh, of the experience of love. If you marry somebody expecting uh, to serve truth, to serve Allah in that marriage, that's a different kind of trust, mm. you see. So, um, what I'm talking about is uh, the way people think uh, in anticipation of their expectations being fulfilled by their partners. Right, and yesterday yeah. you mentioned in that regard that the the time right before puberty mm-hmm. is a very a good very good time to start teaching children how to think well <clears throat> the time before puberty is <clears throat> i write about this extensively in a new book on uh, uh, trust its ontogeny and uh, misplacement mm-hmm. uh is the subtitle um you see, between the ages of zero and um, between birth and seven years, there's a lot of building of the body that has to take place. Mm. And this requires energy, and it requires the formative forces that uh, we are now beginning to identify as being uh, part of what even Nikola Tesla called the ether. Hmm. And uh, this is um, uh, this is an expression of kun fire kun hmm. in the creative process of hmm. the child. For example, the child's nervous system is not completely formed until they're seven years old. Hmm. That's why some children, for example, uh, cannot control their bladder uh, until you know some children get earlier control than others over the bladder, but some others keep on wetting the bed, and you know, until they're five, six, 
even seven years old. Mm -hmm. Now, there are different reasons for that, but and there are psychological um, problems that cause bedwetting to go beyond, you know, the, uh, the, the early childhood years. But normally, a child gains some control of their bladder by the time they're, they're, they're three or four years old. And what I'm saying is that a child who cannot con gain early control of the bladder is because it's not formed yet. The nervous system is still incomplete. And we know that uh, this doesn't take a full completion until the seventh year, until the end of the seventh year. Well, when those first seven years of development are up, the ontological process then metamorphoses. And what I mean by that is that these formative forces that were busy building the organs, building new organ systems, building you know, all those physiological connections and interconnections between the brain and the different organs and organ systems with respect to chemical feedback and all sorts of biofeedback, even from our sensorium, that is then finished by the age of seven. And then a new process begins, you see. And this new process is one of an awakening, okay? You begin to see this with the, the latent child during the seventh, during the eighth and ninth years, whereas before this, grandma was perfect, you see, but uh, now she has a mole on her chin, mm. and uh, she's not as beautiful as she was before, mm. you see, in their eyes. And they want to know, well, what is this thing? Where does it come from? Mm. And uh, they start asking all these, uh, these questions. And uh, sure, they ask, they ask the questions before, when they're four and five years old, what is this, what is that, what is the next thing? Mm. But they don't ask why. Yeah. You see, they don't ask why. So when the child is in their late years, they begin to ask why, who, when, and how mm. things occur. And, uh, you know, uh, Mom, were, were, you, were you crying last night? Uh, I heard you and Daddy making some noise, you see. And uh, what, what, are you okay? <laughs> so they want to know what happened. The the uh, young younger child isn't interested in this. So during these latent years, you need to answer these questions. And you also need to confess that you don't have the answer to a question that you don't have the answer to. Mm -hmm. And Show then, the child that it's okay. It's okay, yes. And then it's okay not to know. Yeah. And then that the, 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 you see the follow-up there is, Okay, well, let's find out, yeah. you see? And I don't have time now, but we'll do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've done, just done with your son, for example. He's, uh, he's at that uh, sort of impressional age. He wants to know about my name. So I'm using the answer to teach him about somebody very important in the history of Islam, in recent history, okay? So we st I'm stringing him along over a couple of days now. And this is what adults are supposed to do. You're supposed to answer these questions, and if you don't know the answer, don't pretend that you do, and don't pretend that it's not important. If the child asks, it's important to mm. the child. Good point. You see? Now, all this has to do with the building of trust, with the building of amana, okay? Is it okay to ask the question? Is it okay to get the answer? And how do I ask? And, you know, I'm not even sure. The kid's not always, he's not even sure why he's asking, you know. Mm. But he's asking because what is, what's he doing? He's searching for the truth. Mm. It's a search for the truth, you see. And when you search for the truth together with the child... And so, you, so, Dr. Omer, very yeah. important point here. Yes. That... Some of the Islamic seminaries, mm. they discourage asking too many questions. <laughs> yes, yes. That's authoritarianism. That's tyranny. And that's what it is. How do you think that affects the child? Well, that's going to deny the truth, isn't it? 
and it's going to deny a certain uh, level of um, uh, esprit de corps. It's going to destroy the group feeling mm. that even Calhoun uh, yeah. uh, admitted yeah. existed in the early Benina period. Yeah. That group feeling, it, it's being lost. When you have a tyrant, uh, and the tyrant is an authoritarian, who just demands obedience, you're demanding taklid. And when you do that, you're closing the mind. You see? And over here, Dr. Ormer does not mean taklid in its legal sense. He means it as in its general linguistic sense. Yes, yes. just blind following. Yes, Just blind following. Now, if you destroy this group feeling, and you, uh, then you're, you're going to cause mistrust, you see. Uh, you know, and th then the child gets confused. Uh, they're not sure if they can trust themselves and like that. You know, the child begins to say, well, uh, geez, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? They begin to I feel, hear that from children all the time. They, you know, I don't know what I did wrong. Yeah, I hear that from children will ask questions mm -hmm. and uh, not getting the answer. They will question themselves. Yes. Sometimes out loud. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what I did wrong. Yeah, it causes it causes doubt, and the doubt here is uh, a doubt that uh, ascends to the heavens because it then begins to cause a doubt in the existence of God or in the existence of a good God. And so then you have the, these children who come out and say, "Well, why does God do that? And why he must be evil?" You see, and. When you when they start thinking like that, you don't have much of a chance chance to explain later. You see, this is the time during these latent years when these questions need to be answered. They need to be answered carefully. Uh, they need to be answered honestly, and sometimes they need to be partially answered. You see, mm -hmm. and um, because the completion of the answer can come later. If the child asks a question and say, well, mommy, why were you crying and moaning last night? You see, and you can begin to answer that question, but you don't have to complete it. You don't have to complete the answer. But you, 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 and there are many, you have, you can be creative with the answer for God's sake, but don't ignore it. Mm. It's an important question mm. because the child's scared. Mm. This, the child wants to know daddy's not hurting mommy, okay, and that mommy's okay, and they don't understand, you know, this moaning and groaning business and the squeaking of the bed screens, uh, bed uh, springs, and all that sort of thing. But they know something's happening. It's not nothing. <laughs> yeah. So they need to know. Uh, oh, that's just uh, that's just daddy loving mama, and. It's an interesting way of love, and, you know, maybe next year, the year after, well, I'll tell you more about it, but don't worry about it, okay? So then you plant the seed. Well, that's a component of love, you see. So love has another dimension to it, you see, in the child's mind. And as long as the child knows it's safe to ask the question and that the, the question is uh, not a dangerous question and that uh, the question has um, uh, some sort of an answer that provides um, uh, uh, security, you see, because they were feeling insecure. Well, if daddy's hurting mommy, what's he going to do to me? You see, you know, it's, everyone's concerned about what's going to happen to them, mm. especially early on. Hmm. Well, why? Well, you see, let's go back to uh, our pre-primordial covenant with Allah when we all stood there and said, yes, you are a God. Hmm. Okay, so that's that's an element of trust. Am I not your God? Am I not your provider? Am I not your hmm. commander? Yes, yes. Am, am, am I not the one who loves you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Am I not the one who created you? Yes. Am I not the one who provided all these things for I you? Yes, you are. Yes, yes you, you are. are. Okay. The next thing they know, they're incarnated, and they're a little helpless little baby. Wah! 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 Where's my provision? Wah! 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 Where's my love? Wah! Wah! Who can I trust in this world? Wah! Oh, oh, um, um, oh I feel good now. Yeah. No. So, 
this is what what I'm talking about here is a continuation of that building of the trust. Mm. Because that trust, what are, what are we talking about? It's a trust fund. Mm. And it's a trust for what? For the gift of life. Mm -hmm. mm. Did I not give you life? Mm. Yes, you did. Yes, he did. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, we don't know. Okay? But he gave us life. And he entrusted us to care for it. Mm. Okay? So if it's not cared for, trust is offended. Trust is insulted. Trust begins to wane. Mm. And is trust, is it trust uh, waning in you? Okay? No, it's trust in God's provision, in God's promise that is waning. So when these insults continue as the child grows and grows and grows, it doesn't matter what you teach them. It doesn't matter. Mm. It matters more what you do. Mm. You see? And how you handle their inquiries, because they're seeking to confirm your ability to complete the trust fund and to teach them how to do it. Mm. Not talk about it, <laughs> but do it, mm. you see. So that's what we're talking about, because during this latent period from the ages of A to pre-puberty, 12, 13, uh, the child is not so concerned with justice as the child is concerned with, well, things are kind of out of place here, you see. Why is that out of place? Why? For, I'll give you an example, okay? One of my first uh, essays was written when I was 12 years old. Mm. It won the contest, and it got me a position in the college prep course at high school. Mm. And uh, so I'm 12 years old, and what did I write about? I wrote a criticism of the United States government for handing China over to the communists <laughs> at, at the age of 12, okay? So I knew this was out of place. It wasn't right. I didn't understand why it happened. And so I wrote this paper, and the question was, why did you do that? Okay? I wasn't thinking about justice, you see. I was thinking about adab. Of course, I didn't know the word adab. I didn't know the, the term existed. Uh, but I knew it was out of order. Why did I know it was out of order? Because, well, America was supposed to be a democracy. Well, it's not really a democracy. It's really a republic, you see. And the Democrats got it all wrong. But that's another subject, you see. Um, uh, the if you, a, a democratic government, a republic, giving another country's leadership over to a tyrant like Mao Zedong, who wound up killing 60 to 100 million of them, you see, I was concerned about my elders who said nothing about this you know of course i never challenged my father about it or any of my teachers i just wrote the essay mm. none of nobody discussed it with me nobody answered my question they just give me a nice piece of paper with the blue ribbon on it and a stamp and uh, told me i won the contest this leads me to a few other questions yes. that are very relevant for mm -hmm. our times. Yes. Um, how is this is this affected by, let's say, masks? Children wearing masks at some level. Affected by what? The children wearing told the children being told to wear masks. What is, <sighs> does that affect their trust in any level? Number one, number two, mm. they're seeing the whole world uh, like injustice all over the world right now, yeah. and no one is telling them. Meaning the parents don't discuss politics. Yeah. You know, yeah. and the parents are not necessarily saying, you know, what you write about in such yeah. and such place or what you're uh -huh. reading about the news, right. this is wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, to give them that sense of, in the language of the great scholar Atas mm -hmm. uh, from the University of Malaysia, he uses the word adab, as you explained yesterday, mm -hmm. to mean yeah. putting everything in its right place. Mm. So we're not putting things in the right place in the minds of our children. No, we're not. So we're, 
not answering their questions. And mm -hmm. then a lot of times we're ignoring things that they're seeing mm -hmm. or feeling or going through. Like, I wonder how many parents have even talked about <laughs> COVID and mm -hmm. putting masks on mm -hmm. and how it makes them feel. Mm -hmm. And because they're being taught this is a scary world. Mm -hmm. And they're being taught, don't trust this world, mm -hmm. which is, you know. Well, they're being taught, don't trust anybody who doesn't wear a mask. And yeah. that's just a lie from the pit of hell. Uh, this is misguidance. This is what I was discussing yesterday. I brought up this topic of, you know, well, why do they, why do they leave their faith? Because every child has this inborn fetra. Every child comes into the world believing in God. Now, they don't talk about God, but they have some inborn sense of a continuity with something that is beyond the physical. This is proven. This is, proven. This is, this is proven. This is a proven scientific fact. So, I'm talk, what, I, what I brought up yesterday is the fact that we're misguiding them by covering fetra, by repressing fetra. And so this is uh, an expression of um, of a lie, and it's an acceptance of a lie and a great lie on the part of everybody who's supposed to be <laughs> defending the truth. So now the latent child will be puzzled by this, and they might even write a paper, but uh, you know, if they don't get an answer, they're not going to worry about it. Okay. It's like, I remember when I didn't get an answer, I, I said, well, geez, writing an essay, you know, doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it got me a, a, a step up on the college admission courses and all that sort of thing, but I didn't know what that meant. Twelve-year-old doesn't know what college is, what it means. You know, I wanted somebody to answer the questions that I was push, putting forward. The question was, why did our government do it? You see? And the question wasn't answered, and I just said, okay, well, I'm not going to waste my time with any more academic effort. <laughs> it's not worth it, you see? So I turned my attentions to, to music, and uh, I began concentrating on music, and by the time I was 14, I had my own little trio and i was actually praying playing professionally and my mother became my booking agent answering mm -hmm. the telephone call and saying well when could when, when when can Le they called me lenny in those days that when when can lenny play can can lenny and his band can they play at our wedding next week that you know this sort of thing so i forgot about academic pursuits i forgot all about it mm -hmm. school was just something that was like a a, a social club. It didn't have any meaning for me. I found some of the subjects interesting, but I, you know, after asking that question and not having it answered, I thought, well, my immediate response, well, I guess the answer isn't not, is not important. You see, it's not important. So then you be, that developed a, in me, that developed a rather careless attitude, you see, and it took decades to correct. Mm. You see? So, that's just my example. So every child's different. Every child's going to react a little bit differently. Um, I did not become a rebellious teenager because nobody answered my question, you know. And I was never a rebellious te teenager. I didn't rebel until uh, I went to college and understood that I didn't understand why I was there. So I dropped out and became a rock and roll uh, uh, singer, you know. <laughs> and I did that for a few years. Anyway, what you do, what, the point I'm trying to make is, is if you don't guide the child through those latent years, you're going to have trouble later with that child. They're, they're not going to meet their giftings appropriately, or they're, they're not going to fulfill those gifts, or they're, they're going to delay the fulfillment of those gifts, you see. I mean, that was a gifted thing for a 12-year-old to write, you see. And I should have been answered, and I should have been coached in the right direction so that when, by the time I did get to college and university, I understood why I was there, you see. But, so what happened? There was no understanding, you see. Understanding didn't, didn't arrive. And that's what's happening when we cover 
the masks like this. When we cover the mouth, you know, well, who's nobody's talking about it. And if they are, they're talking about it in hushed tones. Well, not me. You know, I'm very open about it. There's no scientific reason to wear this mask at all. As a matter of fact, it's more detrimental to wear the mask. And the New England Medical Journal has already attested to the fact that it's pure symbolism. Mm. And uh, the liar, the great liar, Mr. Fauci, has admitted this as well. It's pure symbolism. Well, symbolism brings us back to the greatest practice of magic, mm -hmm. which is the misdirection of the truth. So what are we talking about? We're talking about misinformation. We're talking about real misinformation. We're talking about real mis uh, misdirection. We're talking about the misplacement of trust, okay, by not, not answering the questions truthfully and honestly. So that now we have a, the world is being led by liars, and cowards are following the liars. That's mm. what's happening, mm. you see. Uh, Mal Malcolm X, a person like Malcolm X, would never tolerate this. Matter of fact, he said, <laughs> only a fool would give their children over to their enemies to be educated. <laughs> and that's what's happened. That's what's happened. So, when you don't answer the child honestly, and you don't give the child, you don't promote the uh, asking of honest questions, you see, there's no such thing as a bad question. You, there, you, you, when a kid asks a question, you answer it. If you say, I don't know, we'll find out uh, together, or I think you should go ask brother or sister so-and-so, or I know of this book in the library, you, you direct the child. So what are you doing? You're guiding the child, even if you don't know the answer. But if you deny the, que the ability to question, and you don't, uh, and you don't admit that you don't know the answer, and you pretend that you do, like many doctors, you see, you're performing misguidance. This is misguidance, okay? And where does misguidance take you? It takes you straight to hell. That's where it takes you. It creates hell on earth. And that's what dystopia is, isn't it? We're now living in this Orwellian 1984 dystopia. That's what it is. It smacked me in the face when I landed at JFK. I never saw America like that. Not when I left. I, it was heading that way when I left over 20 years ago. But when I came back and I saw what it is today, I said, oh my God. God, do I really have to be there? And of course, the, answer, the angel answers, yes, you do. Because this man and I, we have something to do together, and it's not misguidance. So did that answer your question? Bro? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so um, you were talking about the latent years and answering the kids' questions, not mm. ignoring them. Yes. And... So now, what about all these Muslim kids growing up in this environment? They're saying, mm. Dr. Omer, up to 20% of the Muslims growing up in America, mm. the kids, not the parents, the kids growing up in America, going to public school, mm -hmm. up to 20% are leaving Islam. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a lot of them actually have a religious you know, families, mm -hmm. they do their salah, they do their fasting in the month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Parents think everything is fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only to find out one day, so, so to say, you know, quote, unquote, the kid comes out of the closet. Mm -hmm. It says, yeah. oh, by the way, uh, Islam, yeah, forget about that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a matter of communication, isn't it? And uh, when there's a lack of communication, it means you, you don't know what's in the heart of the other person. Mm. Okay, so what you're telling me is that many parents don't know 
what's in the heart of their children. Mm, that's right. And uh, that's different from my generation coming up and the generations before me, and from what I understand of reading traditional literature from culture to culture, and especially, uh, for example, the, the, the Native American, or if you look at uh, some of the African cultures, uh, for example, those in the, the, uh, in, in the, the African horn that were very familiar uh, to uh, the prophet um, because some of what the prophet taught and what was taught in those cultures was similar, almost identical. Uh, for example, in the Oromo culture, a young man could not accept a position of responsibility until in, for the community until he was 40 years old. Mm. Yeah, 40 wow. years old. Wow. Okay. Until that point, he was considered in training. Mm. Now, he might be given uh, a, a charge of you know, the, the herd, the goats or the cows or whatever they were um, watching over. But it was only, it, that, that was a limited responsibility. He was not given charge anywhere along the way to make decisions for the welfare of the community. Hmm. Never. Until he had proven himself with his wife. Hmm. Okay? You had to be able to show that you could govern your household and your children before you were giving any tribal responsibility as an elder. Hmm. All right. Now, how were those decisions made? Well, the Native Americans and the Oromo culture had pretty much the same thing. They had a tribal chief, and they had a shura, and they have uh, they had uh, the elders who were the parents of the governing shura, you see, and when the shura was confused, they turned to their elders, mm. and they would say, okay, uh, what about so-and-so's child? What do you think? They would get together, and they, they would sit around the campfire, and they'd say, what do you think about so-and-so's child? And uh, so they'd have a conversation about this child, and they would say, well, he's going to be uh, an expert hunter. Mm. This one's going to be a craftsman. Hmm. Uh, this one's going to be a warrior. Yeah, this one's going to be a chief. Right, and they're all agreeing because they're all they're all agreeing. The same, they're and seeing the same traits, and they're like, yeah, yeah he's, he's so really they're, good at you know martial arts. Or, yeah, so they would they would sit and they would discuss these things, and then they would train the child in the way that he should go. Hmm. In other words, they would train that child to meet their gifts because hmm. they would recognize the gifts. And so, for that, you really need a community, right? You need a community, and because you need a lot parents. Of times parents don't see what the others will see. Yeah, that's right. And you need to discuss these things, and you need to observe your children. Mm -hmm. And you do not need to trust them in the hands of other people you don't know, mm -hmm. the hands of strangers, okay? Mm -hmm. So this goes back to what I started this little circle with. The campfire. You know. Mm -hmm. They don't know their children, do they? Mm. All right. Well, three or four generations ago, everybody knew their children. Everybody knew <coughs> so and so. And the surprising thing is, parents, when I talk to them, when there's an issue, they think they know their children. Yeah. Because but, they have a romantic image in their mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the and result. And they think that they're living back home or in, you know, some co Islamically quarantined area. Uh, and they don't know what they're seeing on the internet or what they're seeing in, in different, uh, you know. No, no. And the know. kids don't want to tell them. No. That's the other difference. Well, that's a lack of trust, isn't it? <laughs> that's a lack of trust. That's a lack of trust. Because they... Yusuf goes to his dad and says, Yeah, but the Inni Raitu, I, had, I saw a dream yeah. of the yeah. 11 stars the yes. the moon. Yes. Here's a little boy going to his. And over yeah. there, it's Ibrahim going to his son telling him his dream. Yes, yes. This is gone, you see. This uh, mis this is miscommunication. They're not communicating anymore, and because they're not communicating, the fitra of one is not is missing the fitra of uh, the other. Mm. You see. So this uh, this meshing that should take place. You see. Look, my hands are interlaced here. There's a mesh, mm. but each finger has its own border. Mm. 
they're touching, okay? What we're talking about is a family uh, uh, situation where the mesh, it never touches. Parents are over here, the kids are over there. There's a gap. Hmm. And in between that gap is a pit, hmm. okay? And that pit represents, well... Hellfire. <laughs> it can. <laughs> it can. It can. So the, the the thing is, you know, people have um, they have misplaced trust in authorities that are misguiding their children. So they're allowing their children to be misguided, and then they're surprised to, to surprised to find out that they are. <laughs> and a lot of time, what drives this? It yes. seems to be, especially the religious parents, they want to, they feel like mm. that it's, it's not, I don't think it's, they don't, they don't consciously, but they want their kids to be in a certain way. Yeah. And that's in their mind that this is how a religious child should behave. And so they're forcing their kids. No, you can't do that. The force, there's no force in religion. Okay. The prophet made that very, very clear. Now, you, you can, you know, discipline your child if you are so predisposed to follow you in prayer. But if you're doing prayer correctly, the child will automatically follow you. It should be like a magnet, right? It should be like a magnet, exactly. They will follow you. And in following, they will also hold discussions with you, you mm -hmm. see? Because uh, what, what are you doing with, with the prayer? You are doing two things you're you're disciplining yourself you're disciplining your body you're disciplining your mind and your heart to act in the coordinated activity of worship okay and then the child sees this and then they they want to know more well why are you doing this da 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 first you know the little ones they just want to play with you crawl all over you see if you're going to get angry with them you know and um uh by but when interfering uh, w with the prayer and all this sort of thing. It's a trial of, of one's patience. But what, you, what you're doing at the end of this discipline uh, ritual, you're then communicating with Allah, you see. The, the disciplined, up until the point of making the dua, there's no, there's no communication. Mm. It's like putting a dime in the old phone and dialing mm. heaven. You see, yeah. and the angels are watching. Okay, well, he did that right. He did that next thing. Yeah, he sees a little bit off, but never mind. The naya is good. So they're writing all this stuff down, and they're saying, okay, call complete. Now let's hear what he's got to say. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, it's yeah. like that. It's that simple. Okay, so then the doa is made, and you're talking to God Almighty. You're saying, please, Lord, forgive me. Please, Lord, let me know what it is you want me to do and whom you want to do it with, want me to do it with, and help me deal with such and such and so and so. I don't know what to do. I need your guidance. I need... So you're talking to God. And the child hears this, or he should hear it. He should be right there with his ear wide open saying, What's Dad saying? Mm. What is Mom praying? Hmm. Oh, my God. He's praying for me. <gasps> wow. Oh, he's praying for Sister Julia. This wow. reminds me, this answered a very important question yes. that's been in the back of my mind for uh, uh, ages, is that hmm. we have on record the prayers of different scholars, different people in history. So yeah. At this moment, he made this du'a, hmm. or at this moment, he made this du'a. Hmm. This kind of answers that, that that gap that we fe fe see today. Yes. It didn't really exist. And mm. so they were a little bit more open in terms of if somebody really wanted to know, they would be able to peek in like kids. And uh, so anyway, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah so w the point I was trying to make here is that of c communication. communication. Okay. So if you're going to communicate with God, how much more should you communicate with your child mm. as a result of your child? being in awe of your communication with God. And how much more so when the child hears you make a specific prayer and then sees that prayer answered. Mm. Okay? 
I don't think that's happening in many homes. Mm. I don't think it's happening. Mm. So, in answer to your question, there's no, there's this lack of communication, this lack of uh, proper direction, this misguidance, is all uh, cumulative, okay? It's causative. It's it's repressing the natural fetra that should flow from, like a river, from heart to heart hmm. in the family. If, if I may interject, yes. this is very interesting to me. Because it's, it's for in my mind, as I'm living my life with mm. my family, mm. it's defining for me what is the experience of a religious mm -hmm. life mm. or a religious family. And I think a big component of that is when you're worried and something, and then you, like the family members know, the kids know, okay, mm. that dad's doing dua for this or mom's doing dua for this. Mm -hmm. And then they see that. Or, or, or you have a certain dream and you tell your wife yeah. and the wife tells yeah. the kids. And when you see that as mm -hmm. a experience, when that dream happens to be mm -hmm. true or, yes. or, you know, and that is now that feminology, that experience. Yes. That makes it real. Well, that's the group feeling we're talking about. It's missing. Mm. You see, it's the, it, that's the sunnah of the early, uh, 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 of the, the, the early uh, constitutional period of uh, Medina, mm -hmm. and also pre-Medina. I mean, those who were close, the companions who were close to the Prophet, they saw these miracles happening. Mm -hmm. They saw this process happening. Mm -hmm. It was communicated. It wasn't something that was abstract and distant. Mm -hmm. It was heartfelt and experienced mm. in their very midst, mm. okay? Now people are experiencing abstract Islam. This is abstract Islam. They're not experiencing the real uh, thing. It's mm. all abstract. It's all, well, that's what the companion says. What about you, Dad? What did you do? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like the, it's like the kid who, who, who finally gets to a certain age. He's 15 years old, and he finds out his dad was a soldier, uh, in, you know, the, whatever the war was. And he said, geez, Dad, what did you do in the war? Hmm. Yeah. Well, what did you do in Islam, Dad? Hmm. How, how has Islam formed you? What has Islam done for you? Why, why is he asking these questions? Or should be asking these questions? Because he wants to know what it's going to do for him. Yeah. You see? He doesn't want some abstract story about somebody else who lived a thousand years ago. He wants now, here and now, because here and now is what prepares us for the hereafter. Not a thousand years ago, not two thousand years ago. It can if those stories are told in the correct form, with the correct message, with the correct guidance. But if they're not told, it, it, it correctly, if they're not told lovingly and with meaningful relevance, the kid's just going to sit there and fall asleep. Like most people I see falling asleep during the kutbah. You see? Yeah, because, the, you know, people are, get preachers are getting up there, they're recycling the same old gibberish. <laughs> you know, it, it's not relevant. Kids want to know, geez, Dad, if this mask is a lie, why are you making us wear it, mm. okay? And why aren't you speaking out against it? Why, why aren't you telling me the truth about it? How come I have to learn the truth about this from so-and-so? Why don't you tell me, Dad? Huh? Why don't you know, Dad? You're supposed to be guided by God Almighty, aren't you? I'm playing devil's advocate here, okay? So, you know, here's the 17-year-old the smart aleck teenager who says, you're supposed to be guided by God Almighty, aren't you? Why don't you know these things, Dad? You see? He's finally getting back at all those years that his dad was playing God Almighty himself as a tyrant. Mm. Yeah? So the kid's getting a few punches in there. You see, he's boxing. Metaphysical boxing. It's okay. It's honest. The kid's being honest. 
You'll say, oh, he's being disrespectful and you want to, you want to smack him, right? No, he's being honest. He's challenging you like he should be challenged. You see, this is, Muslims don't think these things are important. Alim don't think these things are important. That means they don't understand uh, child psychology. That means they don't understand human development. And anyone who puts an imam in charge of a masjid who's not married, <laughs> he's, he doesn't understand the sunnah. He says he does, but he doesn't. You see? So this is, relevance is what we're after because it's only due to relevance that you can establish the truth in a Tawheed fashion that it's going to enforce trust. Okay? So the kids don't trust their elders and with good reason. And when you can't trust your elders, if your elders are not providing for the commonweal, that's a whole lot more than a roof over your head and food in your stomach. Mm. You need food for the soul. You need what uh, Jesus called the bread of life. Okay. Do I have time to explain that? Yeah, sure. Okay. We have about another ten minutes. So okay. Easily... Well, let's discuss this thing called the bread of life, because... What is bread? Oh, Jesus. They say that Jesus said it's its body, but uh, I don't think he really said that. We're not sure what the NGO really said. It was toyed with so much. But let's just look at the analogy, because the, anal the analogy is, is valid throughout the Torah, not just with what Jesus uh, referred to or Christians uh, like to refer to. He said, this is my body. This, he held up the loaf at the Last Supper, apparently said, this is my body. Well, it's a singular loaf. Well, what do you, what you mean by that? Well, let's look at the uh, precedents in the Old Testament. Uh, there were people of so-and-so and people of so-and-so. We know this also from the Quran. The people of uh, Lut, the people of uh, Noah, and so, so forth, okay? Well, if we look at Jacob, He's called Israel. Now, Israel was his name, but Israel also represents the entire nation of the Jews, okay, as opposed to the Ishmaelites, okay, two different nations, two different loaves of bread. So, what Jesus was saying is, this is my Ummah, okay? Are you getting this? Yeah. Because... This is my Ummah, okay? Now, Let's take the analogy of the bread a little step a step further. How do you make bread? <laughs> well, you've got to clear the land. <laughs> you've got to plant the seed. You've got to keep it safe from weeds and predators. You've got to fertilize it, march it carefully so that it grows properly. Then you've got to harvest the wheat. Then you've got to sift the wheat. Remove the chaff, dry that grain out, then you gotta pound it up into powder, then you gotta mix it with some water and whatever else you wanna put in there, then you gotta knead it <laughs> real good and hard, then you gotta bake it. Okay? So, if you want a good umma, that's a lot of work. Okay? And he said, this is my Ummah. Okay. Well, who was he talking to? He was talking to those who were predominantly Jews because he came to the Jews. Uh, he wasn't concerned about the Gentiles. It's not his job. And, um, and even when he comes back, he's not concerned so much about the Gentiles. Sorry, everybody. But he's concerned about the Jews. He's come back to judge them. And he's going to start by killing out the Yaw. Okay. So, he's talking about his Ummah. Well, who is his Ummah? Is it just the Jews? No. He said, whoever... Uh, he said, you know, 
people asked him, well, who, who is, uh, you know, your brother and your sister? And he didn't say, my brother and my sister are Jews. He didn't say that they're Yahudis. He didn't say that. He said, they are those who obey God Almighty. Now, the Christians like to say, right in translation, who obey my father, but that's not what he said. Who obey the originator, if you get back to the mm. uh, linguistic uh, roots. It means originator, it means creator, mm. okay? And so, the people who are the brothers and sisters, and we call everybody brothers and sisters, right? Mm -hmm. The real brother and sister is the one who obeys God Almighty, mm. all right? And that is the one who follows true guidance, true Hidayah. They are not misguided. Okay? So, I'm saying this so that you get to the point, to another point here, because there's a, a passage in, our, in uh, the Indio, uh that says, uh, uh, if your brother offends you, uh, he slaps you in the cheek, turn the cheek, you see. You turn, you know, and you turn it, you turn the cheek and you let your brother insult you, okay? It doesn't say, let your enemy insult you. Mm. It says, let your brother insult you, because we're all brothers uh, who are striving. This is the real uh, war, all right? Uh, we're all striving to become obedient slaves, obedient servants of Allah, and sometimes we make mistakes and we insult each other, mm. okay? So if I insult you, then you turn the other cheek, and I get ready to hit you, and I say, oh my God, what am I doing? You see? Mm. Your enemy's not going to do that. Your enemy's just going to keep on hitting you until mm. his arm falls off or mm. you, you fall down. So what I'm saying here is that... Um, if you turn your children over to your enemy and let them insult you, that's the same thing as, you know, turning your cheek and letting them slap you in the face, slap you in the face, interminably, without end. <coughs> this is what's happening in the Ummah. Now, the kids see this, the children see this, they don't understand it necessarily in the terms in which I've just explained it, okay? But that's what's happening, okay? And then they get to the point and they say, Dad, what did you do in the war? Well, geez, Dad, what did you do for Islam? What did Islam do for you? And then they say, gosh, pretty impotent, isn't it? You can't, you can't oppose your enemy. You can't up and say, you can't stand up and say, this is a good day to die. Yeah? You can't stand up and say, you people are lying. Yeah? So how many of your uh, alim have jumped right into the lizard's hole with this COVID nonsense? And your children who can read and think like I could at the age of 12, watch you do this, then they ponder and they say, Gosh, my elders are pretty stupid. I better not listen to them anymore. Okay, have I ended that good by now? Yes, <laughs> the round two is done. <laughs> oh, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, inshallah, uh, pray for us, everyone, mm. and subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. And uh, we'll do, inshallah, round three, uh, either tomorrow, inshallah, if Allah wills. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam.